Tonight in Arkansas, there's a mother tucking in her daughter and turning off the light. A business owner is burning the midnight oil. An at-home dinner date is plating up possibility. And it's all happening under one roof. How? The power of a conversation. Like the one John from Integrity Solutions had with First Horizon Bank about his vision for a sustainable mixed-use building. Now it's not just words, it's life. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Today's show is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash space to learn more. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9... Ignition sequence start. Space nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And hello again. Thank you for joining us on the podcast we call Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here, Fred Watson there, and a giant void between us called Space. The final <laughs> frontier. Uh, Fred, hello. How are you? I'm all right, thanks, Andrew. I suppose technically what's between you and me is actually yes. Earth. Yes. Because we are... On a curve. We're on a curve, that's right. And we're far enough apart that the curvature of the Earth plays a, plays a role in it. Mm. So, um, so <laughs> I'm not... It's not space at all. It's solid matter. Solid. Yes, which, is in, which is in space. All right. So, technical. All right. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm being a bit picky there. But, that's all right. You're entitled to be that. So, Sound like, sound like my wife. Now, today we are going to be um, discussing the tracking of ice using lasers. We're talking about Earth ice. Uh, and the um, InSight lander uh, mission uh, to Mars, I think. And that, that's rather fascinating. I love their website, by the way, if, um, if you want to have a look at that. We'll talk about that shortly. And another audience question, this time uh, coming from, uh, I believe it is... Charlotte in the United States. Uh, Ronald Nubo has uh, sent us a question asking about um, where the, uh, uh, the universe gets its energy. And it's a great question because um, there are all sorts of um, things at play here. So uh, we'll get back to that shortly. But uh, first, Fred, uh, the tracking of ice on Earth. We, we have talked about ice and ice crystals uh, as observed from space on Earth before and on other planets for that matter. But uh, what's this one all about? Yeah, this is um, a, a couple of missions that um, are being launched this year, in fact, uh, later this year. But they're both, um, in a sense, um, descendants of an earlier mission. Um, I, I think you and I, actually, it was before the days of Space Nuts, but you and I talked uh, often about a pair of spacecraft called Grace, and Grace, the two Grace spacecraft were in orbit around the Earth. Uh, they were very unusual. That Grace is an uh, is an acronym for, if I remember rightly, Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. And what it was doing, the, the, this pair of spacecraft, I think they were they were in the same orbit around the Earth, but one of them was 200 kilometers in front of the other. But they had uh, microwave links that meant that you could sense the distance between them to an accuracy of one thousandth of a millimeter. Wow. So they're 200 kilometers apart, but you know that distance with an accuracy of a thousandth of a millimeter. And what that means is that as, the, as they pass over areas of slightly higher and slightly lower gravitational pull on the Earth, the Earth's gravity varies depending on where you are because it's, you know, it's, 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 it's more over the land than the ocean and things of that sort, mm. very, very slightly, nothing that you would ever perceive uh, as, a, as a human. But to a sensitive experiment like GRACE, uh, the, the distance between the two spacecraft changes slightly as you go over these concentrations of mass. Um, so the first one gets a tug uh, forward by the mass underneath it, um, which is not replicated until the second one catches up with it. So the, the distance between them separates as you go over a mass concentration and then contracts again. Uh, and that uh, is what the GRACE experiment was all about. It was incredibly successful. And in particular, was very, very successful 
at monitoring the uh, the re reduction of the ice burden, the ice that covers the nation or the continent, subcontinent of Greenland. Uh, Greenland's ice is disappearing. We now know that it's reducing by the staggering amount of 14% per 10 years. Wow. 1.4% uh, per year. It's a huge amount. Um, uh, uh, actually, I beg your pardon, that is... That is a slightly different uh, statistic. That's not the Greenland ice. That is the sea ice in the Arctic around Greenland. Yep. So um, the Greenland itself is is also losing um, losing huge amounts. Uh, so uh, what has happened is that this was so successful. Um, actually, before I say that, Andrew, I might just go back to the statistic I was looking for uh, every year. Greenland loses about 280 billion tons of ice to the ocean every year. And that's due to climate change and global warming. That's lots of people putting ice in their drinks. Yeah, well, when you think of it in those terms, that's absolutely right. 20, 280 billion tons of ice. And of course, what that contributes to is the 3.4 million millimetres per year rise in global sea levels. Mm. It's pushing the global sea level up. So, um, we, of course, this is such a hot topic in geophysics, climate science, as well as space science, that that is why uh, a follow-up spacecraft uh, has been uh, designed and will be launched this year. It's called GRACE Follow-On. So it's the same sort of thing, two spacecraft uh, with microwave uh, ranging to, to detect their separation. But this time, it's also going to have a downward-looking laser range finder. So what that means is that you can work out the height of the ice above the sort of sea level. And that allows you to make much more uh, accurate calculations at, at any given point on the Earth's surface. That, that would be quite revealing, I imagine, because, uh, yeah, we, we think of uh, ice uh, melting, but uh, it has altitude as well, which um, yeah, would obviously right. reduce during a melt. That's, that's right. So um, it's all about... Um, uh, actually, this this also links with the second one of these spacecraft. Uh, let me just talk about that briefly. It's now called ISAT two, uh, well, which I follow like that one. ISAT, I mean, as far as naming things goes, that's 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 pretty good. It's um, it, it's uh, a European. Actually, uh, it's a NASA spacecraft, but it's it's following on from a European spacecraft, which is called Cryosat. Cryo just means cold. Yeah. Uh, Cryosat is a mission that's been in, in operation for quite some time. Uh, and what Cryosat does is sends radar pulses down to measure the height above sea level of an ice flow. So if you've got a, you know, a lump of ice and you, you can measure it's the height of the top of it above the sea level, then you know that uh, it's nine times as deep below sea level mm -hmm. as well which gives you um, a, a measurement of the volume of the ice there. So it's all about working out how much sea ice there is. And so the ISAT-2 uh, will actually do this job. So both, um, both uh, GRACE follow-on and ISAT-2 will fly lasers, which will actually detect uh, the height of the ice above, uh, above the sea surface. So they're both going to return very interesting information and much more accurate estimates of these you know these um, huge masses of ice that are being turned into ocean water every year yeah I, and i would imagine that uh, they'd come back with their data pretty quickly yes that's correct absolutely We're not going to have to um, wait long to find out how bad things really are yeah in fact we um in um in the world of science when you've got real-time measurements going on uh, these measurements, you can't just read them off on a ruler or anything. They have to go through um, data processing in order to, uh, in order to uh, you know, get the, the numbers you want out of the raw data. And what we do is, uh, we do this in astronomy as well, we set up what's called a data pipeline. And the, the idea is to automate the process as much as possible. So you put the raw data in at one end and you get the numbers you want out at the other. Uh, data pipeline software is very complex. It engages many of our software engineers at the Australian Astronomical Observatory uh, in order to make this work uh, as well as possible. Uh, but it would be the same with the space missions. The pipelines would give you the, the, you know, the, the, basically the, the, the data you want very quickly.
Mm. Um, ISAT 2 does have one other attribute that is quite remarkable. Um, it's, it's got a, 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 a laser on board that essentially repeats at a frequency of 10 kilohertz. That's 10,000 times per second. And so that's the number of measurements you get as this thing flies above the ice. Um, it's really a very remarkable piece of kit and will give us, I think, almost contour maps of the, of the ice uh, near the Earth's poles. I think it's something that we will follow with great interest when, uh, when these missions take off. Yes, and, and that's this year, you said? It is this year. I'm not sure of the dates. I suspect they might not be firmly set yet, but they, they are planning to be this year. Okay, we will certainly follow that up when the time comes and uh, I'm a little bit apprehensive about what they're going to tell us, but uh, I think we're all pretty much aware of what's going on around the planet at the moment. This is Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley here and Fred Watson. Now let's take a little break and find out more about our sponsor, ExpressVPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. Uh, this is the one I use. I've been using it for a couple of years and I love it. When I joined ExpressVPN, they were, they were brand new, uh, new to the market, but uh, I read a lot of reviews and did a lot of comparisons. And there was just something about their, their business model that I particularly liked. And a couple of years down the track, honestly, can't complain. Their interface is very easy to use. Their, their service is second to none. Uh, I've had to contact them a couple of times about um, certain things that I wanted to do, and they were brilliant. So you may be wondering why I do need a VPN at all. It's all about privacy. Uh, do you really want big tech companies, governments, and others knowing uh, what's going on with your online activity? Even if you're having nothing to hide, it just feels downright creepy. Uh, I think you'll agree. And governments are getting more and more interested in what you're doing every day. And so, yeah, protecting your privacy is what VPN is all about. And how often do you uh, run across websites that you want to get information from only to find that they're geo-blocked? This is becoming an increasing problem, but ExpressVPN solves that problem for you. Uh, now, if you go to our special URL, you'll see quite a list of things this service can help you with, things you may never have thought of before. As I say, it's the one I use, secure, fast, and it just works. Uh, so protect yourself online today and find out more about how to get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's T-R-Y-E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash space for three months free with a one year package. Try expressvpn.com slash space to learn more and you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. Now... Back to the show. Three, two, one. Space nuts. Once again, Fred, we're headed to my favourite place in the universe, the planet Mars. Uh, and uh, NASA's InSight lander uh, is just about uh, ready to, to lift off. Well, not yet. It's going to be a little while. But uh, it's going to be uh, a very exciting mission. Uh, Mars is uh, just an ex extraordinary place. Uh, its geograph uh, geological features are mind-blowing. It's a smaller planet than Earth, but a lot of its features are just massively bigger than ours. It's got the biggest mountain in our solar system. It's got uh, a canyon that makes the Grand Canyon look like the squeamishly <laughs> small and insignificant canyon, and so on. I mean, this is just an amazing place. So what's going on? Why, uh, what's, what's the significance of the InSight lander? It is all about um, understanding the planet itself, Andrew. And just to throw in um, one other interesting little um, factoid into the, the, um, the, the Mars uh, features that you've just mentioned, Mars has about the same land area as the Earth does. And that, of course, it's only half the diameter of the Earth, but it doesn't have oceans. Mm. So the same, roughly the same surface area as we have on our own planet, which is kind of vaguely interesting. So what is InSight? Well, it is an acronym, first of all. Um, uh, it's a mission, uh, a NASA mission. Uh, it, it, the 
Name means interior exploration using seismic investigations, geodesy and heat transport. And that kind of makes insight. Uh, actually, I liked uh, originally this spacecraft was going to be called GEMS. And GEMS is the geophysical monitoring station, which I actually like a lot better. But insight maybe uh, was chosen just to let us know that it's going to tell us a lot Easy about, to sell to the media too. Yeah, exactly. That's right. We will get many, many insights. Um, it's a, a spacecraft that built on a former spacecraft that you and I, once again, back in the back in the two thousands, back in the noughties, we we talked about, and that was uh, Phoenix, which landed on Mars in two thousand and eight. Phoenix was a stationary spacecraft, not a rover. It's basically just a platform uh, which uh, actually had a a, a little. Um, backhoe shovel on it that let uh, uh, Phoenix dig into the Martian soil. It was in the Arctic region of Mars and very quickly discovered that only a few millimetres below, below the surface of Mars, there is water ice. There's a permafrost of solid ice. I actually yeah. remember seeing a photo of the scrape and the ice, you know, the, the, yes, the vivid right. white against the, the, dark, exactly. the, the deep red of Mars. It's an amazing photo. Yeah, I used to show that quite often in talks and um, some interesting stuff because the, some of the crumbs of ice that were, um, you know, extracted in that process uh, over a matter of a few days, they, they didn't evaporate, they sublimed. Sublimation is a process that goes straight from a solid to a vapor mm. uh, and it happens in vacuums like the, or, or low pressures like the um, atmosphere of Mars. Anyway, Phoenix um, was uh, a very successful uh, lander, and so what they've done at NASA is they've they've used bits and pieces left over from Phoenix to build something else with a very similar, you know, very similar um, uh, uh, chassis and uh, similar similar structure for things like the solar panels. There are two big solar panels on it, uh, reusing as many components as possible, but to do a different job. So whereas Phoenix was just literally scraping the surface of Mars, this one is all about trying to understand the interior of Mars, which is why the first letter of INSIGHT stands for interior, interior exploration. Um, and so it's got seismic investigations. Its instruments, um, uh, several of them, uh, basically have uh, seismic, um, you know, se seismic um, uh, functions in mind. Um, there are uh, there's something called the heat flow and physical properties package, which is basically uh, there will be a, a self-penetrating heat flow probe uh, which will uh, go into the surface of Mars and look at the actually up to five meters below the surface of Mars to measure how much heat is coming from the core of Mars itself and, and tell us a bit about the, the thermal history of the planet, how, how it's, the, the heat sources in, within it have evolved. Uh, then there's uh, one that will accurately measure the rotation of the planet Mars, because understanding the rotation of planets tells you something about the structure of them inside. We've seen that happen with the, the moons of Saturn, for example, with the Cassini mission. Uh, some of the really interesting results that have come from Saturn's moons have all been done uh, because of the rotation of these moons and looking at how they rotate as, they, as the moons go around in their orbit. You can do the same sort of thing with Mars. Um, and then there will also be atmospheric probes looking at the temperature, uh, the wind speeds that, uh, that, that, that InSight will experience. Uh, there's a magnetometer to measure magnetic disturbances, uh, all kinds of odds and ends like that. And in, interestingly, a laser retroreflector. Uh, what that means is that if you fire a laser at it, uh, it will come straight back to the source. And that's a very, very good way of measuring distances accurately. So if you've got an orbiting spacecraft, an InSight will actually have, I think, a pair of orbiting nanocube satellites, um, or, or CubeSats anyway. Um, I think um, you, you can fire a laser down at the surface, get a reflection back. You work out the distance to a matter of millimetres. And once again, if you, if you know the orbital parameters of something in orbit around Mars to a matter of millimetres, it gives you some insights into the, <clears throat> excuse me, into the internal structure of Mars. So a very, very interesting and rather complete spacecraft. Why is it in the news? Well, because they've just done some tests that show that the solar panels actually unfurl properly. They fold up like Japanese fans, actually. They're rather lovely to watch. As you said, you can uh, see 
the, um, the, the footage of that on the Insight website. It's mars.nasa.gov slash Insight. And you will also find there, <clears throat> at least if you're looking at it now, that there are 80 days, 11 hours, 30 minutes, and two seconds to the liftoff time of the spacecraft. It's yes, going to take... They're, they're launching it on May the 5th, May the 5th. Uh, which is disappointing because I thought May the 4th would have been a much better day, being Star <laughs> Wars Day. But, um, uh, well, the launch window is May the 5th to June the 8th, so it won't necessarily be May the 5th, but um, they're expecting to land sometime in late November, which will be uh, very exciting indeed. Uh, yeah. Is this uh, also going to be testing or, or trying to detect whether there's any seismic movement in yes, Mars? so that's the that's that's the sort of one of the principal things. Um, you can't. So this is natural seismic uh, activity, um, uh, rather the same sort of thing as was found by the seismographs that were left by the Apollo astronauts on the moon. We learned a huge amount about the moon from the seismographs that w were left there and radioed back to to uh, to, to the Earth, um, because what these things do is they pick up the uh, the tremors caused by, and they're microscopic tremors, but they're tremors nevertheless caused by uh, impacting meteorites on the moon. Now, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, no. so they're not slowed down very much. Mars has a thin atmosphere, but there are still meteorites, we know, hitting the surface of Mars, because we've seen evidence of that during the time that Mars has been explored by orbiting spacecraft. Uh, so, yeah, so... Um, Insight will pick up the effects of those and hopefully tell us more about the interior of Mars. Mm, it'll be fascinating. So, yes, we'll definitely be talking about that uh, as it gets closer and as they start to learn what they learn when uh, Insight is on the surface of the planet Mars. This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here and, of course, Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Rightio, Fred. Uh, we have yet another audience question. This one comes from Ronald uh, Newbo. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Ronald, in Charlotte in the United States. North Carolina, perhaps? Although I don't know if there's more than one Charlotte in the US, so I could be wrong. I know there's only one Dubbo, and that's where I live. Uh, which means Red Earth, by the way, in the Wiradjuri language, we believe. Now, uh, Ronald, I am a fan of the show and have a question for the show. Good, because if you'd asked me, I wouldn't have a clue. Uh, I hope the question hasn't been answered yet. I don't think it has. Um, if space is accelerating, where is the energy coming from? And uh, does it mean that it's contracting rather than expanding? Fred? Interesting. Yeah, so this is right at the you know the cutting edge of modern cosmology, the the science of understanding the uh, origin and evolution of the universe as a whole. So just to to sort of recap on the picture that we have, <clears throat> we know that uh, probably thirteen point eight billion years ago, that's the best estimate we have of the of the date. Uh, there was an event that we call the Big Bang. It um, was a very hot event. We simply don't know where the energy for that came from. Um, it, it's, you know, few people have postulated that you can get energy out of nothing. That seems a bit uh, a bit counterintuitive to me. Uh, so you start with nothing and suddenly you get energy. But the bottom line is we know that this event was extremely energetic. And it was followed um, almost immediately and within you know a tiny tiny fraction of a second after the big bang itself by a period that is called inflation uh, the inflationary period lasted for about 10 to the minus 33 of a second it wasn't very long but in that time the universe expanded by uh, a factor of about 10 to the 50. So it went from being the size of a melon to being the size of a galaxy in a tiny tiny fraction of, of, of time. Um, and that um, is the commonly accepted explanation for why the universe looks so uniform in all directions, which it does, with, with a few little ripples of heat on it, which is what eventually caused the, the galaxies. So that expansion, uh, the, the inflationary expansion was very brief. Where the energy for that came from, we don't know. It must have been inherent in the Big Bang itself. Uh, but the, 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 the fireball, as it then was, um, cooled over a period of time uh, that allowed 
you know, the, the radiation, which is what it was to start with, to turn into matter, uh, and the subatomic particles that make up everything around us to be formed, of which there are very large numbers. So um, all of that uh, is fairly, you know, it's fairly well understood if you ignore the fact that we don't know what the sources of these energies were. Now, the expansion continued, and back in the 1970s, we believed that the overall gravitational pull of the contents of the universe, like the galaxies, planets, stars, radio stations, podcasts, all of that stuff um, has gravity, except the podcasts, there's no gravitas whatsoever attached to ours. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, and that, that. But the gravitation of, of all the you know, all the matter in the universe, was expected that it would slow down the expansion mm. because that's the gravitational pull of the universe on itself, as it were. Um, but in 1998, that was thrown out the window when we discovered that actually the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And this is what uh, the, the, the question refers to. So the acceleration of the expansion is now pretty well uh, you know, well known. It's been measured several times. There are different ways of measuring it. You always get the same answer. The universe is expanding at an accelerating rate. And the, the energy source for that has been basically one of the big puzzles of the last 20 years. It's 20 years ago since the, the uh, uh, acceleration was discovered. So the best the, the, there are let me let me just put it this way there are competing theories for that and in some ways what we've seem to have done is narrowed it down to one um, which is it's got the slightly cryptic name of the cosmological constant uh, because this was a term in an equation that einstein put in uh, uh, to make the universe static and then took out again when he realized it was expanding. But if you put it back in, but with a negative sign, it turns out that it makes the expansion accelerate. And so Einstein was probably right to have this cosmological constant. But the point that I want to make, Andrew, is that the name, forget about cosmo cosmological, that's just telling you it's about things on a very big scale. Mm. But constant is telling you that it's a single number. And that number is basically... Uh, the way it's, a, it's a, a sort of energy parameter for the universe, so that every piece of space has this constant energy. Now, and it's a repulsive energy. What it's doing is forcing space apart. But as space gets bigger, the volume of space increases. And because the cosmological constant is per unit volume of space, that increases as well. And so there's more energy as the universe expands. And it's that more energy that causes the acceleration. I can see from the... Um, I'm, try I'm trying to understand it in my mind and, and, and it just sort of... I, I can hear what you're saying, but my logical brain says the argument's falling back on itself. How can something that requires more energy as it expands, create more yep. energy as it expands. Yeah, it's an, no. <laughs> it's yes. a, it's a, it's a self-defeating argument. Uh, we don't know the answer to that, but that seems to be, it fits the, that model fits the observations best, that, you know, for every um, increase in volume of space, you get a corresponding increase in the energy uh, because space has its own intrinsic energy. Now, it's what that is... the chicken and the egg. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it is. It's the chip, but the whole universe is a chicken and an egg, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, the the best the best. Uh, um, well, this is probably a, a, a few years old, but the the theoretical physicists who tried to understand this theory uh, they built they built models as to how this energy should work, and they got answers that were a factor of ten to the power one hundred and twenty too big. Uh, so those models are clearly wrong because the universe would have ripped itself apart um, billions of years ago. Um, it's it's uh, um, something that is, as, as, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the hot topics. What is the cosmological constant? Where does that energy come from? How does it relate to the, the energy of the Big Bang itself? We don't even know the answer to that. Um, 
But what it isn't, and we can categorically say this, it's not a contraction. Uh, the expansion is taking place ever more rapidly. And from what we know now, it looks as though it will continue ad infinitum, that the universe will continue to expand um, and, and has a very uninteresting and boring future in store because as it expands, eventually nobody will be able to see any other galaxies. We can see galaxies elsewhere now, but as they, as they sail over the horizon because their, their light will never reach us, um, then that means you've got a very lonely universe indeed down the track. I don't want to depress everybody about that. Yeah, well, but we won't have to worry about that. That's, maybe that's, on the, that's on the squillions of years down the track. Yeah, it is. It's yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. But I, it, it, it brings up an interesting point because um, when I was growing up, one of the theories was that the universe would expand uh, until it could expand no longer and then it would contract back yes. into itself. That's so that's right. now been dismissed. Yes, it has, um, because um, the measurements all indicate that it's expanding more rapidly. It, it, um, uh, that, that theory is basically what we thought. As I said, um, we thought the gravitational pull of everything in the universe would gradually slow the expansion and eventually halt it and um, result in a collapse of the universe. And the end product of that is something that is variously called, well, a lot of people called it the big crunch. But Brian Schmidt, who was the cosmologist, one of the cosmologists who discovered the, the accelerated expansion, he had his own name for it. He called it the Gnab Gib which is the Big Bang backwards, <laughs> uh, because it was the opposite of the Big Bang. Yeah, so the like that. <laughs> That's great. That's really great. So in answer to your question, uh, Ronald, um, the universe is uh, expanding and accelerating all at the same time. Uh, we think we know a, a theory as to possibly why this is so, but we really don't. <laughs> is that, Captured in a the, nutshell as always. That sizes it up? Yeah, but, yeah, but we we can tell you categorically it is not contracting. So That's hopefully um, that answers your question partially. Uh, and we do, as always, encourage your questions. We love to hear from you uh, via our Facebook uh, and Twitter feeds and any other way you want to get in touch with us, uh, please do. Fred, a pleasure as always. Thank you so much. A great pleasure to talk to you too, sir. I look forward to the next time. Indeed. We'll catch up with you very, very soon. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory and from me, Andrew Dunkley, thank you as always for listening. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes, Audio Boom, and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com.